Hello, and welcome to the OLT Podcast. I'm Stacy Treckless, and I'm here with you today to talk a little bit about web accessibility. We've talked about accessibility in working with students with disabilities in several of our other podcasts and in workshops, too. Uh, it's an important subject and one that we need to be continually aware of so that we can best serve all of our students' needs. So today, I'd like to give you just about five really good tips for making your course uh, materials that are online in particular that much more accessible to uh, students with disabilities. So first I'm directing you to the web accessibility resource page on our website which is pnc.edu slash distance and then all you need to do is click over to effective course design and web accessibility. So that is this page, which of course is just add web accessibility to the end of the distance and you'll get right there. Uh, this page has a lot of different links and things on it, uh, including a little bit more detail about why we care about web accessibility and what it really means in terms of making information accessible to all users because we do have to remember that not all users use a keyboard and a mouse to control their computer. Some folks will be using touch screen devices. Some folks will be using screen readers and other types of assistive technology that helps them use their computers in a hands-free way. So when we're working with those folks, we have to make sure that our documents and PowerPoints and videos and those kinds of things are always going to be accessible to all of those different types of learners. So I do have some uh, slides and other handouts available here as well, stuff from uh, previous workshops that we've done here at PNC. And we also have a link to the Office of Disability, uh, Disability Services here on campus. They have some tremendous resources on their website as well um, to help you understand how students can get accommodations, what a documented disability means, uh, and what accommodations really mean. And it also provides some information for both you and the student as far as how to work within uh, the framework of disabilities and accommodations so that you've leveled the playing field for all the students uh, that you're working with. We also have on this page uh, a link to some accessible syllabi. These are syllabi that are uh, set up in an accessible format so that they are more uh, well, they're more accessible, right? So these are great tools for you to use to create any type of document. It doesn't have to just be a syllabus, although a syllabus is a common thing that we all use, uh, and we tend to use Microsoft Word for that. So these are Microsoft Word documents, and I have the basic one up here. And um, you'll notice, first off the bat, that you have a navigation tab, which you can close, but by default it might open up for you. And it uh, will allow someone, in, in particular people with who are using a screen reader, it will allow them to navigate anywhere on the page at any point. So if they want to go just to the course policies, they can navigate right there, and it allows the screen reader to start reading at that point. So it's really excellent for screen reader users, but it's really good for everybody, anybody that has maybe already read a big long document. Some of our syllabi are fairly long. Um, so, you know, maybe they've already read it all, but they want to go back to just that one part that talks about something in particular to what they're concerned about at that moment. I have used what's called headings to set this up. And you can do this on any document. It's very simple. In Microsoft Word, you have on your home ribbon, which is this initial one you see with all the uh, font changing and the styles and the colors and things, there is a styles pain area. And this area typically has uh, some really basic styles, um, including heading 1, heading 2, heading 3, maybe, maybe heading 4 and 5, paragraphs, um, things like that, basic stuff. So if you think about it, it makes sense. It's, it's just like an outline. So heading 1 is the top stuff. Uh, heading 2 is then the smaller stuff, uh, you know, just underneath heading 1 and so forth and so on. So think outline and that's basically what you're building here.
Uh, of course, if you don't like the initial styles that Word gives you, I have changed mine. So uh, by default, it's usually uh, a, ser a serif font instead of sans serif font. And um, you can always create a style or apply styles at any time. You just click the little arrow to bring this down so that you can um, either you know change them, modify them, do whatever you need to do. So. That is one really important tip, uh, using Word and using the headings. So you may want to try and get used to the idea of just selecting when it's a, uh, a, a title, a big title, select heading one instead of going through and selecting your stuff and changing your fonts and your sizes the old-fashioned way. Try this instead. It might actually save you a lot of time, and it might even make a, a nicer looking um, page for you as well. So these syllabi templates include a lot of language and uh, help along the way. So especially if you are new to the university and you don't have much of a syllabus up already, uh, this provides all the guidelines and support that you would need in order to make sure all the university policies and those kinds of things are in place. Now. As far as Blackboard goes, we all know Blackboard is an important resource that lets us organize all of our content uh, for our courses and provide handouts for students, provide a place for them to download the syllabus, and those kinds of things. So Blackboard is, by nature, fairly accessible. Uh, it does include a lot of functionality for folks using screen readers and other assistive technologies, but you do have to help it out a little bit by providing it with uh, accessible documents like the one we were just working on. Uh, however, within its core, and there are some links that, uh, that will help you further understand some, uh, some information about working with the web and working with Blackboard, here, um, I'll just bring up a course and you can kind of see some of the features very briefly. This actually just happens to be a course about web accessibility, uh, among other things, so it happened to be a good test for this, for this course, uh, for this podcast. So, you will notice more or less that you can, throughout Blackboard, use the tab key to scroll around. Now, of course, if you have a lot of menus, uh, this can take a while, but you do have the ability to scroll around, open things up, and so forth using only the keyboard. And this is really important for any program that needs to be accessible because if you're a screen reader user, you tend to only be using your keyboard. Most folks, uh, you know, if they're unable to see or unable to really use a mouse. So uh, the keyboard winds up being their best friend. And so if something is not capable of being navigated by the keyboard only, that creates a real problem. So most screen readers also have built-in shortcuts for uh, accessibility. And uh, that also helps, so they will know, students will know those shortcuts if they're using those tools. But it is good for you as a faculty member to know that uh, Blackboard is fairly accessible as, as it goes. And now, as far as the types of things that you would put into Blackboard, um, that might include things like PowerPoints uh, or PDF documents. And so, I have uh, adopted a policy where when I do use uh, slides in my classes, what I tend to do is provide a uh, video lecture version that has usually me talking. Um, often there will be some sort of captions, sometimes not, so it depends sometimes on the course. Um, ideally, I should have captions on everything, but if you can't get captions on everything, a great alternative is to provide the slides, the whole downloads, including um, including the notes in your PowerPoint. So if you'll notice on this PowerPoint, I have the notes being used uh, here at the bottom of all these slides. This is more or less the entire transcript of what I would say in a video or if I was in front of students directly uh, in a classroom. So by providing this for people, they can just read if they choose to just read or if they 
don't have a choice because they might not be able to hear me if they have a hearing disability, then they will be able to still access the exact same information. Now, many people already write down their lectures, so it really might not take you much time at all to just sync up your lecture, uh, you know, script or notes right into your PowerPoint just by pasting in your, uh, your notes right into the page. And this could potentially save you a lot of time in the long run because then when you're creating that cool video, say in this video studio like I'm in today, you will be able to just read your whole script. Uh, right there and um, it will save you a lot of time and provide you with a very nice script that you can use over and over. So this is an, a policy that I've personally adopted in all my classes and it has worked very well. Um, it tends to make my students happy, even students without disabilities, because some folks maybe they just don't work in, or uh, attend school in a place where they can always be loud or they forgot their headphones on a particular day so they can't listen to a video they can still read what's given to them whether it's in captions or whether it's in a slideshow format like I just showed you um, they can still read all the information that was uh, that they were being asked to review it's a great solution to uh, to help a lot of different people and alternately Providing the video with audio helps other types of students, uh, especially students with um, cognitive disabilities and learning disabilities, because they tend to prefer to hear the what's going on, and sometimes they need to be able to hear and read at the same time so that it gets uh, the information gets into multiple channels. Now, as far as uh, PDF documents, you may have some PDF documents that you use uh, for extra readings or handouts or other things that you provide for students. Uh, this is fairly normal. I have a few here, and I think the key thing that you'd want to remember is that uh, your PDFs should be, uh, should be documents that have text that can be selected. Now, ideally, you'll want PDFs that are tagged, uh, and that is more or less the same thing as our Word document with all of its headings. Um, PDFs are a little more complicated than Word documents, but if you, for example, you take your Word documents and save them as PDFs, um, when you do use the headings, uh, it will help you um, add the tags, it will actually add the tags automatically for you, uh, more or less, when you go to save that document as a PDF. And you can in fact check this. I'm going to open Word now and save as and change it to PDF and make sure that I have some options set. And if you check your options, it will it will ask you, it just is usually on by default, document structure tags for accessibility. Just make sure that's checked. It usually is by default. And as long as that is, when you have saved your document, it will tag it for you uh, with Adobe through through the Adobe software. So that when someone opens that document in a screen reader, it will be able to see where the headings are and create the same navigation functions as we're seeing in Word. This particular document has text that can be selected, which is a good thing. There are PDFs out there that if you tried to use the arrow key or the, the little uh, cursor tool and tried to select something, it would just select the entire page because there's nothing really there to select. Uh, this happens sometimes with scanned documents. Um, it also happens with pictures and other things that you've scanned in. And of course, those things are very hard for someone to to view, uh, to, to read if they're using a screen reader. So uh, try to avoid using those kinds of documents if at all possible. Uh, if you need support in changing a document that's been scanned in and hasn't been changed into regular text but it is a text-based document, uh, you can visit the IS Help Desk or you can come see me in Tech 206 and we will help you make sure that your document is OCR or optical character recognized uh, so that it, it does have selectable text. If you have a document that has a lot of graphics, 
Um, you might want to think about providing a text description of those graphics somewhere. It could be on a separate document. You could use Adobe Acrobat, which you could come to my office and I can help you with that, to set it up right there inside the PDF, which is a little bit more of an advanced technique, but it's certainly uh, possible to do. Um, but we want to make sure that everyone has access to the same information, of course. So if looking at the picture uh, provides a certain amount of information that the student would need, then providing a text version of it, some sort of description um, for those people who can't see it, is excellent all the time. And you should always be in the habit of doing that. If you have figures, uh, graphs, things like that, um, then it is very helpful to have a text discussion about that uh, somewhere. And that could even be something that, for example, um, in this little module here, I had a big list of things. And it might be, if this was my picture with figures and things on it, maybe right underneath there I just add a text description of figures document. And it could be just a very simple text document that just describes um, the stuff that's in there. And maybe only students that happen to have a disability would ever open that document, but you never know. Some folks, um, maybe some with mild learning disabilities, would really be, uh, be fortunate to be able to have that document as well because then they could also read that and it might help give them further understanding of what they're looking at. So as far as video goes, you may use all kinds of different videos in your classes. Um, as we talked about before, you may record your own videos and you may be providing lecture notes or creating your own captions. Uh, like this, this video is captioned, for example. I actually took and transcribed the video and added the captions through video editing software. This is certainly an option. And in fact, at the university here, we do have closed captioning services available. So if you have a lot of video that does need captioning, um, you can get uh, access to some different services. Uh, if you wish to do it yourself, there are a few different options for that. You can use Camtasia, and actually YouTube has its own built-in captioning option. Um, it does also do automatic captioning. YouTube uh, automatic captioning isn't that swell. Uh, it doesn't always work that great. You have to check it for its grammar. It tries its best, but it's, it's sometimes, well, quite frankly, it says some very interesting things. So you, you might get a kick out of it, but you'll want to change that stuff probably. Uh, however, if these are videos that are not yours, um, maybe they're very long, you don't have time to transcribe them, then there is um, other options as well. We can uh, send it to, um, if it's 10 to 20 minutes, I would be happy to do that for you out of my office. If it's a little longer, um, the Office of Graduate and Extended Learning does have uh, captioning tools available and they will be able to caption your videos. Uh, and for even longer videos than that, maybe um, you may have to look into talking with the Office of Disability Resources and have some of that stuff sent out to a third-party company that will transcribe everything and return it in uh, within a week. It actually, and sometimes even quicker than that. It happens very quickly. So uh, that's a great thing to know, um, you know, so that you can get access to uh, captioning services should you have a lot of video that you need captioned. Um, if you are using a YouTube video, like for example, if you build content YouTube video, use the mashups tool, and um, I'm just going to look up instructional technology accessibility, since that's what we're talking about, and see if I get any videos that might be captioned. Because that is always ideal. If someone else has already captioned a video that you'd like to use, then that saves you a lot of work and a lot of time. Um, you can certainly review videos and see whether the captions are there or not, uh, and that will that'll help you tremendously. I think this one, it looks like, might have captions. So we can select it to preview it, and we can also get the YouTube URL so that we know where to get it on YouTube. I'm actually going to open it there as well, so we'll have both. And when you are... Um, 
creating a mashup, you do have a choice of whether or not you'd like students to be able to access the YouTube URL to see it within the YouTube context instead of just in Blackboard. Uh, I often check that myself just to give them another option, especially just in case they have pop-up blockers or something on their machine and it's not coming up for them within Blackboard. So I'm going to go ahead and add this to my class. And you can watch the video here. You can run it. And if it has closed captions, there will be a CC button down here in the bottom. And you can click that on and off to turn the captions on and off. That's super. Um, if you don't see that little icon, then it does not, unfortunately, have captions. Video, of course, is, you know, it's a tougher thing for a lot of folks to work with because you need special software sometimes uh, and you need a lot of time sometimes, depending on the length of your video. But just remember that we are out there to help you and that uh, this will, in the long run, increase the accessibility and the overall quality of your course. So please. I hope you will take some time to check out all of the resources that we have on all kinds of topics, uh, especially PDF accessibility that we just talked about, uh, closed captioning services, other resources for creating accessible content uh, within your Blackboard courses and elsewhere, uh, anywhere you've got uh, a need to share things with students electronically. Uh, this is a great page to see if you're on the right track and if you ever want any help at all, please be sure to contact me. I would be more than happy to help talk to you about any and all uh, issues working with students with disabilities. So I hope you've enjoyed the OLT podcast for today, and thank you very much for watching.